Dr. Wright's going to introduce the vendors. Okay, good. Yeah. 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 Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Grand Rounds today. We are super excited. We have Dr. Falaudi from Nationwide Children's Hospital, who is going to be presenting a fantastic lecture for us today. So you are all in for a big treat. Um, those of you that are joining us via Teams, please make sure that you mute yourselves when you join. Don't hit mute all because that mutes the speaker. Hit just mute yourself. And then at the end, when it's time for Q&A, just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your questions. Just shoot them right out because it's quicker that way than us trying to find them in chat. Um, we don't always get them pulled up right away. So this way, just shout them out. Well, you don't have to shout, but just get them out and then we'll answer them right then. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wright, who is kind enough to introduce our speaker today. And so I just, again, I just invite you all to sit back and take in all of the great information that you're going to be hearing today. Thank you. So um, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I get to have the pleasure of uh, introducing someone I've known for many years now. Um, who I've known since my fellowship, uh, who I consider a mentor, who helped train me, um, Dr. Filotti. Um, she has uh, a, a extensive CV um, and knows much about this uh, field of neuro-oncology, uh, probably knows, has forgotten more than most people will ever know. Um, she trained at the University of Toronto uh, for um, her medical training and then has had uh, spent time at various institutions, including St. Jude and Cincinnati Children's and now Nationwide Children's. Um, she's been uh, instrumental in, in developing uh, and leading several um, uh, groups within uh, neuro-oncology, including the, uh, being the chair of the Pediatric Brain Tumor, Tumor Consortium. Um, she works with COG, uh, with the uh, CNS committee, uh, being the chair of that also at times. Has been um, uh, chair of the International uh, DIPG Registry and also uh, now the Connect Network um, uh, also. She has a extensive uh, history of research and um, neuro-oncology, including uh, uh, high-grade gliomas and, and other diagnoses. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Filotti. Well, I have to say it's such a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. And it feels like coming home because Dr. Wright and Dr. Chow um, are, are good friends and colleagues. And um, I have to tell you that um, Dr. Chow and I have led sort of parallel lives. Um, we are both um, Canadian explants who um, trained at SickKids together, went to St. Jude together. Then I was, um, I had the privilege of recruiting Dr. Chow to Cincinnati Children's. And now we've sort of worked our way up in Ohio and we're still neighbors. So um, it's lovely to be here. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit over the next um, few minutes about precision medicine in pediatric um, neuro-oncology. So in terms of um, my disclosures, um, I've got clinical trial support from PTC Therapeutics, Bayer and Pfizer. And what I'm gonna do, or I hope to do over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, is to give you a little bit of an overview about um, the impact of molecular characterization 
um, in pediatric CNS tumors. So I'll start off by giving you an overview of sort of brain, pediatric brain tumors in general, and then talk about how the whole field really has changed for us in the past decade and allowed us to really move forward with novel ways of finding integrated diagnosis based on both pathologic and molecular characterization of um, tumors, some of which are completely novel tumors that um, we've only recognized because of molecular characterization. And then look at how molecular characterization has also affected our ability to stratify uh, patients better, both in terms of how it affects their treatment and their prognosis. And then talk a little bit about some of our recent successes. I, I want this to be a uh, not a depressing talk about brain tumors, but one that sort of leads to hope. Uh, and we have had some successes over the past um, few years, so I'll focus on those. And then um, also then go from now being able to do molecular characterization, what does this mean for the future of pediatric neuro-oncology clinical trials? So to begin with, um, as you all know, we always were taught that brain tumors were the a most common solid tumor um, in pediatrics. But in fact, in the last um, few years, um, we now know that brain tumors are in fact even higher than leukemias in terms of incidence. About 5,000 children in the US get diagnosed with brain tumors every year. And unfortunately, brain tumors remain um, the leading cause of cancer-related deaths um, in children as well. If you look at the distribution of CNS tumors, they, if you had to sort of take the two biggest, it's really the gliomas here, which include low grade as the most common tumors, high grade gliomas, other low grade gliomas, and ependymomas are actually a glial tumor as well. So th those fit in this um, bucket. And then you have the other big group being the embryonal tumor. And the, ch and the tumors we see most often are the medulloblastomas. But then more, um, more recently, we've also defined other kinds of embryonal tumors like um, ETMRs, and of course we've had ATRTs for a while, but these are sort of the biggest uh, two groups for us. And I think it's really important to recognize how molecularly characterizing things has really changed um, how we define and treat patients with brain tumors. So over the, so in the past 20 years, initially, what we looked at when we stratified patients was clinical diagnosis, pathological diagnosis. Um, and then over the last five or 10 years, we've recognized that trying to integrate these diagnoses with molecular testing, which includes either whole exome or whole genome sequencing, methylation array, which has been really important for us, as well as RNA seq or fusion panels to really recognize some of these driver aberrations that we have that we can sort of define treatment by. One really good example of this was um, a paper published by Gene Wong uh, based on ACNS0332, which was the high-risk medulloblastoma study that also include what at the time we called primitive neuroectodermal tumors. So these were embryonal tumors that often happened supratentorially, included pineoblastomas. And basically when they went back and did methylation on all those patients who had what we used to call supratentorial PNETs, um, this is what we found that among the 60 patients enrolled on this study with uh, supratentorial peanuts, when they did methylation and compared it to 216 reference tumors, you saw what you see here. So each dot is one of those 60 patients. So you had this group that were all the pineal tumors, so they clustered together as pineoblastomas, but all the rest of the tumors basically clustered in different areas. And of the 31 remaining um, remaining tumors or remaining patients with um, what we had called supratentorial peanuts, 71% of them were actually not embryonal tumors. So that's, that's incredible. 71% ended up being other things, most commonly high-grade gliomas, and then atypical teratoid raptoid tumors, as well as ependymomas. And what was also really intriguing was how different um, the outcome was for these patients. So if you look at the five-year event free survival for high-grade gliomas, it was 5.6%. This is with a backbone of um, craniospinal radiation, pretty intense um, platinum-based chemotherapy, whereas five-year event free survival for the other embryonal tumors was 62.8%. So this clearly showed us that molecular testing is really important, particularly methyl methylation in pediatric brain tumors, particularly the supratentorial tumors, for actually accurately diagnosing these patients. And then based on that diagnosis, 
treating these patients appropriately given this difference in outcome. So the other diagnosis that has really, we've learned, we've truly learned the landscape of this group of diseases are the high-grade gliomas. So pediatric high-grade gliomas um, were sort of a big entity. We followed what the adults did until 2012 when um, two investigators, Susie Baker at St. Jude and Nada Jabado at McGill, um, noted that about 80 to 90% of patients with diffuse intrinsic ponting glioma, which is a high-grade glioma specifically in the pons, had um, had H3.1 or H3.3 mutations. So these are histone variants that were recognized for the first time in any human tumor. And since then, over the last 10, 10 years, we've now noted multiple other subgroups within high-grade gliomas, including the H3.3 G34. These are the supertentorial, usually high-grade gliomas that we find, IDH1 mutant tumors, PXA-like tumors, which often have a BRAF, uh, V600 mutation that we can also target, and then a whole group of uh, other tumors that I won't necessarily go into in detail, but one group that's of particular interest are the younger children, the high-grade gliomas in kids with, who are less than four years of age who tend to have um, fusion-driven tumors, so either NTRAC, uh, ALK, or ROS um, tumors. And what's been really interesting, based on all these novel molecular characterizations that we've found in the last few years, the World Health Organization classification that came out in 2021 actually defined a new entity for us, which was called the infant type hemispheric glioma. And basically the definition for these is that these are astrocytomas, they have to present early in childhood, they're usually hemispheric, and most importantly, they have a presence of either an NTRAC, ROS1, MET1, or ALK fusion, or if you, you're not doing fusion testing and you do methylation testing, just like I showed for the peanuts, they cluster around um, a, a profile that is specifically called the infant, um, infant type hemispheric gliomas. And this will have implications for treatment that I'll go into in a few minutes as well. So then again, thinking about how um, molecular characterization has affected our ability to diagnose accurately the World Health Organization classification for CNS tumors was updated in 2021. And what was incredible is we're all, including me, who's done this for many, many years, are still learning about these new entities. Because what ended up happening is multiple of these entities, including what we've known uh, for you know decades, ependymal tumors, medulloblastomas, all ended up being redefined um, very much in terms of um, the molecular characterization of these tumors. And so when you look at um, the World Health Organization classification just on this page, and this is not inclusive of all the diagnoses, all of the starred ones are actually newly defined or subdefined tumors. So yes, we always had medulloblastomas, but now they're defined as the different subgroups and subtypes, including ependymomas. And then some of these are completely new entities that we've never had before. So now that we've sort of looked at how diagnostically it's important to have molecular characterization, what does that actually mean for um, stratification, right? It's all great and fun and lovely when basic scientists come up with a million different molecular ca characterization definitions, but what does that actually mean for us as clinician, clinicians when we're trying to stratify this, these patients and treat these patients? So I'm gonna focus the next little bit on how stratification is um, affected by these new findings. So historically, when I finished my fellowship, medulloblastoma was an entity that was an embryonal tumor in, your, um, in the cerebellum. And um, basically the way you stratified them was clinical and pathologic. So clinically, if you had metastatic disease, if you had greater than one and a half centimeter residual, uh, or if you were anaplastic, when you looked at the medulloblastoma under the microscope, um, those patients would be considered high-risk patients and all the others would be considered average risk patients. Well, around early 2000s, and you can see some of these papers quoted here, we started to molecularly characterize medulloblastomas and noted that there are actually four different sub, um, subgroups of medulloblastoma, the Wnt subgroup, sonic hedgehog, group three and group four. And over the last decade, we've had multiple further subtyping of um, um, of medulloblastomas. Why do I put all this up? Because at some point, this becomes 
a little irrelevant, right? We can't have, we have 5,000 kids with brain tumors a year. We have a, 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 a group of them who may have medulloblastomas. There's no way we can subtype them into like 40 different subtypes. So really for us as clinicians, is which stratifications actually matter and how are we going to define how we're going to treat these patients to make sure we've got improved outcomes. So in 2023, this is now our clinical and molecular classification of medulloblastomas. So again, as you can see, we keep the clinical classification. So if you have metastatic disease greater than one and a half centimeter residual, you're still considered higher risk. But if you have a Wnt tumor, you actually have really great outcomes. So these are low risk patients. If you have no metastatic disease, less than one and a half centimeter residual, and you're a Wnt, you're actually lower risk. And I'll explain what this means in terms of therapy. Um, and again, I won't go through all of these, but suffice it to say that this actually makes a big difference in terms of how you stratify patients. The other group that is um, has a really good outcome are, are the group four chromosome 11 loss patients. So again, these are now newly defined as even lower risk patients who on protocol are getting lower dose radiation to see if the outcomes are going to be equal. And then of course, the higher risk patients are getting higher dose radiation. And if you can imagine that medulloblastoma patients average age is about five or six, you can imagine giving 18 gray versus 23.4 versus 36 gray, how much that can affect ultimate outcome neurocognitively and psychosocially. So again, looking at now we've stratified, what does this all mean for prognosis? So, um, sorry, again, if we, what we did in the children's oncology group, we've recently published uh, results of both the average risk medulloblastoma study, which is ACNSO331. Now remember, this was done in the era of non-molecular analysis, but what we retrospectively did is we took those data and did methylation on all these patients to see, did that actually matter? Did, did how we treat these patients actually matter? And we found that um, on retrospective analysis, there actually did break down into the four different groups. So again, just we, as we talked about before, the Wnt group had almost like 100%, 90-something percent um, event-free survival at five years. The worst actors were the group three patients, and the other two sort of sat somewhere in between. Similarly, we looked at the ACNS 0332. I, I showed you the PNET arm before. Now this is the high-risk medulloblastoma arm. And again, if you look at outcomes for them, based on the type of tumor you had, the WINTS did great. Um, and again, you can see how the sonic hedgehogs and the group threes and fours did. So this was really important, meaning your stratification isn't something you're just doing for the fun of it. It actually makes a difference in terms of outcome. What was also really important as, as we go into trying to define how these things affect treatment was that in the group three patients, the group that got carboplatin did better than the group that did not during radiation, right? And in only in this group did it matter if you gave carboplatin during radiation. It didn't matter in any of the other groups, but it mattered. It was statistically significant in this group. So not only did it affect prognosis, it actually defined how we should treat these patients for future studies. So, so far we've talked about the role of molecular characterization in diagnosis, in stratification, and in prognosis. The most important aspect of this, how does it affect treatment, right? So one of the things that we've found now that we're doing molecular characterization, we're finding a lot more patients with cancer predisposition syndromes. So one of the early studies that was done in 2017, looking at PD-1 blockade with pembrolizumab and all the PD-1 inhibitors that are now um, deriger in other adult um, solid tumors, was that um, Leah et al. published this study in Science looking at mismatch repair deficiency and how that predicts response to inhibition by a PD-1 inhibitor, in this case, pembrolizumab. So just to set the scene for you, this is what we call a waterfall plot. So what you have is this is the change from baseline in your tumor size. Anything above the line is how much it's increased in size. Anything below the line is negative. This is decreased. The tumor is decreased in size by this much. So what was really interesting was that among these patients, there was a 46% objective response rate, meaning tumors shrank in 46% of patients who'd had multiply recurrent solid tumors, um, but had mismatch, mismatch repair deficiency 
and complete responses happened in 21%. And when they actually looked at it, about 40 or so percent of these patients had Lynch syndrome, oftentimes previously undiagnosed, right? So what was really incredible with this was that pembrolizumab in 2017 got approved not just for adults, but in adults and children with mismatch repair deficient um, tumors. And this was the first time that FDA approved something without histology being a factor. So if you had mismatch repair deficiency, then you would get, and you had a solid tumor in either adults or kids, this was um, approved as, um, as something that was solely based on your biomarker and not your actual histologic diagnosis. Similarly, NTRAC inhibitors, remember we talked about the infant, the young child, high-grade gliomas with NTRAC, ALK, ROS fusions. So laratractinib is an NTRAC inhibitor, um, and this was the phase one study that was done um, uh, a few years ago, looking at, again, these waterfall plots showing the amazing response. So if you had an NTRAC fusion, every single patient responded. Quite a few of them had partial responses. If you didn't have an NTRAC fusion, this one responded probably because it was an NTRAC 3 or something else that you know, at the time they couldn't recognize, but these patients did not respond, right? So again, FDA approved this in 2018 for adult or pediatric solid tumors with NTRAC fusions. Again, histology agnostic, not just in adults, any tumor that has this would be able to get this as an FDA approved drug. And then what does this mean for um, patients with high grade gliomas or low grade gliomas, which are the populations that also have this? Another study was just recently published showing similar results in children with brain tumors, because part of the concern was, does larotrectinib actually get into the tumor? And we found that it does. And again, very nice responses, waterfall plot showing all these patients shrinking their tumor sizes, uh, most of them with high-grade gliomas or other, um, some of them are also low-grade gliomas. So um, similarly, pediatric low-grade gliomas are now really defined, we think the majority of them are MAP kinase-driven pathways. So whatever kind of low-grade glioma you have probably is a MAP kinase-driven pathway, and that means that you can actually um, try and target that MAP kinase pathway through MEK inhibition or other types of inhibitors that are now out in the market, some of them beginning hopefully to be approved, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So these were studies that were done um, in the last 10 years or so in the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium. So this was a study of selumetinib, which is a MEK inhibitor, um, in patients with BRAF aberrant, so BRAF V600E mutations or BRAF fusions that occur a lot in pediatric low-grade gliomas or patients with neurofibromatosis-associated low-grade gliomas. We know about 10 or 15 percent of patients with neurofibromatosis can get uh, tumors, low-grade gliomas, so this is a population that um, we really want to help. So again, as you can see, each of, um, and I, I don't know if I mentioned this, each of these is one patient. So again, waterfall plots showing for multiply recurrent low-grade gliomas who have a BRAF aberration, there was a 36 percent um, objective response rate, meaning um, patients whose tumors shrank by more than 50 percent. So if you look at the waterfall plot, many more actually had a response, but objective response is defined as 50 percent decrease in tumor size. And also importantly, two-year progression-free survival was 70 percent, meaning two years after starting um, selumetinib, they still had not progressed, which was really great. Even more impressive, um, was the study for NF-associated low-grade gliomas. And as you may know, selumetinib is now approved for plexiform and other um, NF-associated tumors, but it actually doesn't have um, approval yet for low-grade gliomas, although these data are pretty impressive, and I think they're considering getting approval um, for this group. So again, if you look at these data, 96% of patients um, had not progressed at two years on, on, these, um, on selumetinib with a 40% response rate. So you can imagine what an impact this has on a child who has a tumor this big, sitting somewhere in the hypothalamus and optic pathway, and then it shrinks down to this, right? These patients um, often, if you have um, central midline tumors that are optic pathway, they can lose their vision. They usually get carboplatin vincristin, so they've got all sorts of other issues with platinum-based therapy, hearing loss on top of vision loss. So this has really um, been an important um, advance in our armamentarium for the treatment 
of low grade gliomas. And so this phase two recurrent study then led to the current studies we have in the children's oncology group looking at newly diagnosed, not recurrent patients with NF-associated low-grade gliomas, non-NF-associated low-grade gliomas, and then recurrent low-grade gliomas in combination with vimblastin, which is a um, drug that also has a good efficacy for low-grade gliomas. So again, these studies are now comparing what would be considered standard of care upfront for low-grade gliomas, which is carboplatin vincristin, um, the experimental arm is selimetinib. There's a two-to-one randomization, so you're much more likely to get selimetinib than carbovinc, but then we're also then looking at event-free survival, so at two years, four years, five years, how well are patients in each of these groups doing, but also really importantly in these um, COG studies, we're also looking at other outcomes like visual acuity, motor impairment, neurocognitive outcome, quality of life outcomes, Again, recognizing selimetinib is an oral drug that you take twice a day, carboplatin, vincristin, IV combination that you get for 18 months. You know, sometimes you'll get it weekly, sometimes you'll get it monthly. But again, all of these things may be affected depending on what we find in, um, in these outcomes. So um, the other really amazing thing that's happened just in the past year for pediatric brain tumors is again, looking at impact of molecular characterization on treatment, are patients with BRAF V600 mutated low-grade gliomas. So this was literally published, I think, the last month or so in New England Journal. Um, this was a, a multi-institutional global study that Novartis did, looking at the combination of dibrafenib, which is a BRAF inhibitor, and trametinib, which like selimetinib is a MEK inhibitor. So this is a combination that is used in adult um, um, tumors as well with really good efficacy. In fact, the combination of the two has fewer side effects than each agent alone. And so the data for this um, were really impressive. So what they did was they took 110 patients um, or so um, and with newly diagnosed BRAF B600 mutated low-grade gliomas. And they randomized them again in a two-to-one manner. So double got dibrafenib, trametinib, and 27 or half of them ended up getting carboplatin vincristin, which is considered standard of care. And as you can see, in terms of objective responses, this one knocked it out of the park. 47% of them had at least a 50% decrease in size of their tumor compared to 11% in patients who got um, standard of care carboplatin vincristin. Even more impressive was the median progression-free survival, and I can't actually read it from here, but I think it's something like 21 months versus something much less. So statistically very significant. And again, these are for, for those who want some orientation. These are Kaplan-Meier curves um, with percentage survival up here and time um, from treatment down here. So again, if you look at key uh, markers at one and two years, you see what a difference how much better the dibrafenib trametinib group is doing compared to chemotherapy. So this has been a seminal paper, truly now redefined how we treat these patients. So a patient walks in today with a low-grade glioma with a BRAF V600E mutation, they're no longer going to be getting carboplatin vincristin. They will be getting dibrafenib trametinib. And this is really exciting for us because it's rare in pediatric oncology in general for, for drugs to be approved for pediatric indications only, but this has been sort of a really great um, step for us. So now that we've sort of talked about how molecular characterization affects diagnosis, affects stratification, affects prognosis, and affects treatment, we've realized that these things can actually make a difference. How is it going to change our paradigm for future studies? So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the CONNECT consortium, which is the Collaborative Network for Neuro-Oncology Clinical Trials. This is a 24-site international consortium um, that we set up while I was first in Cincinnati, and now we've moved it to Nationwide Children's. And the mission of this um, group is really to expand access and develop really novel scientifically sound clinical trials for children and young adults with um, CNS tumors with global collaborations, right? The key is we want to make sure kids around the world can get access to these drugs, and we want to make sure we take science from everywhere to do this. So these are the 24 sites, and I won't go through all of them. The operations center now resides at Nationwide Children's. And um, we have two arms to this consortium. So we have a preclinical arm led by Chris Jones, um, 
who is uh, in the United Kingdom. He's a He's an amazing basic scientist who's done a lot of work, particularly for pediatric high-grade gliomas. And then we have the clinical trials arm. So in the preclinical arm, what we've set up with um, the under the leadership of Chris Jones is a really big preclinical testing program where we, kn we now have over 200 different pediatric brain tumor models uh, uh, among the 18 or 20 sites that are part of the preclinical um, testing through Connect. And basically the idea is that we will do global collaborations, that we'll have labs that champion a particular thing. They'll bring in three or four other labs because we want to make sure that if we take something to a clinical trial, we're not doing it just based on one lab's results and then subjecting 50 kids or 100 kids to something that nobody else would have been able to replicate. The idea is you make sure those data can be replicated in other models, in other labs, and make sure they actually make sense before you move them forward. And that leads to the really robust preclinical assessment. We have a really great group of um, basic scientists and translational scientists who review the data before any of us agree that some of this can be moved forward to actually be given as treatment to children. So again, um, just summarizing all this, we just recently published um, a um, paper to look at how we should ideally be evaluating preclinical um, data as we move into clinical trials. And it's really important for us to sort of match some of these criteria, some of the things we talked about. You know, is it actually effective? Is that can we do it in combination? Is it better in combination? Has it been tested in multiple models and replicated the same thing? Have multiple labs done this, or is it just one lab and nobody else can replicate it? And how does it actually affect the target? Because sometimes you have to come up, once you've taken it to clinical trials, you can't go back and re-biopsy these patients. You have to see, Imaging wise and clinically, are they getting better? And is the drug actually inhibiting its target? And if you figured out how to look at that in blood, in urine, in CSF, in some other way, you can actually make sure you assess the target mod mod modulation. So this is what you do in the petri dish in vivo, in, in vitro. In vivo, you also wanna check CNS penetration. It may look great if you've got stuff happening in vitro, but does it actually cross the blood brain barrier? Does it give you a survival benefit or does it just shrink the tumor and it comes back? And so all of these things are really important in terms of how does it compare to standard treatment? And again, have you looked at it in multiple models? So based on these preclinical um, data, we now have a ton of different tumor types that we're testing preclinically. Pre We've got multiple drug companies that are um, working with us and funding sources for, for this testing. And here are some, and this is not all inclusive, but these are some of the researchers who are doing this great research to try and move forward to this, which is how are we gonna expand treatment options for patients with um, some of these really difficult to treat diseases. So mainly the focus of our group has been um, on high-grade gliomas, diffuse intrinsic pontine gliomas. Why? Because these are the most vulnerable populations we serve. They, a lot of these tumors have a dismal prognosis that hasn't really changed in the past 30 or 40 years, and we're desperately trying to make it better. And oftentimes for recurrent patients with medulloblastoma, craniopharyngiomas also, because honestly, other than radiation and surgery, there's not much else that we can do for them. So this has really been the focus. So currently, these are the protocols um, that we have at Connect. These studies, this study has already been published and there's going to be a phase two that I'll talk about in more detail. This is ribocyclic everolimus in patients with DIPG high-grade gliomas that had a um, small study but had reasonable outcomes that we're now moving into a phase two. These are the open studies, again, uh, for high-grade gliomas. I won't go through all of them. So the ones that are um, outlined in red are the ones that are currently enrolling. The other ones are going to open in the next um, six months or so. So these are all um, in the works. Um, one that I'm really proud of as well is this CIOP Connect Young Child Medulo study. This is going to be a randomized study looking at what the Europeans consider standard of care for young kids with nodular desmoplastic sonic hedgehog um, M0 medulloblastoma. So com com comparing the standard of care, which is the HIT-SKK regimen in Europe, um, to the Head Start 4 regimen, which is um, what many sites use um, in North America, and um, really looking at primary outcome of neurocognitive outcome, right? We're trying to decrease therapy for these patients. They do really well, but part of it is, again, they're young children who are three and four years of age or younger, and we wanna make sure um, that neurocognitive and 
just quality of life outcomes um, are preserved as much as we can. So um, as we talked about just earlier, you know, when you look at pediatric high grade gliomas, we talked about the diagnosis and the fact that they have this histone mutation. We also talked about what if they have a BRAF B600E, low grade or high grade, we have ways we can um, we can um, treat those patients. And we talked a little bit about NTRAC fusions, but there's also ALK and ROS fusions. So if you're thinking about the next group of studies for high-grade gliomas, how are we going to design this knowing what we know? So this is what we hope to be opening in the next couple of months through the Connect Consortium. So this is a phase two study um, called the TARGET study, for children, adolescents, and young adults. So if you're age one to 39, you'll be able to enroll on this study. There's a screening protocol. So any child within any of the 24 sites um, of the Connect Consortium, which as you saw is in multiple different countries, will who has who's been given a diagnosis histologically of a high-grade glioma, will then have central rapid molecular characterization within three to four weeks. Um, and this includes, just like the molecular characterization initiative, at the Children's Oncology Group, which is actually led by the team at Nationwide through the Institute for Genomic Medicine and Elaine Mardis and Rick Wilson, will do whole exome sequencing, a fusion panel, DNA methylation. These are really the cornerstones of trying to define things molecularly with return of results in time for us not to delay the therapy, right? That's been one of the banes of our existence over the last four or five years. We've learned all this stuff, but it takes us eight weeks to get results back. We have to start these newly diagnosed kids on radiation and other therapies, so we missed the boat. Now we know that we can actually do this within a three or four week period. And then based on um, whatever the um, aberrations are that we discover based on the molecular characterization, patients will then be um, be given one of these 10 different arms based on their aberration. So we have groups with PI3 kinase, AKT mTOR, MAP kinase, ACVR1, all these different things. So, and really this should encompass 95 or honestly 100% of patients with high-grade gliomas. So um, the other idea is, again, this, we've done high-grade glioma studies for 50 years. We haven't improved outcome whatsoever in any of these K, uh, patients, except those rare patients now that we're finding with a BRAF B600 or NTRAC fusions and things like that. So what have we done wrong? Well, what we've done wrong was we would do these studies, think, oh gosh, you know, angiogenesis, best thing that ever happened, immunotherapy, best thing that ever happened. We keep doing these studies that are 50, 60 patients, they take us three, four years to do. We don't collect biology. We don't collect serial samples. The study fails. We're back to square one. The idea of this study is every child gets molecularly characterized, gets what they should be getting based, based on the best knowledge we have in 2023 and the, the drugs that we have available that are molecularly targeted. And in addition to that, and equally importantly, longitudinal assessment of genomics, in genomics and immune profiling, not just in their tumor, but also in the CSF, in blood. And we also want to integrate this with assessment of response, not just clinically, but imaging-wise, quality of life. So basically, our goal is each of these arms will accrue about 40 patients. So if you have about, say, 400 patients enrolled on this study, let's say even if a couple or more of these um, studies prove futile, that we don't actually improve outcomes. What have we done? For the next generation, where, when I hand the torch on to the next generation, which will be soon, at least they'll have a really great integrated data set that basic scientists, translational scientists can actually look at and mine to inform the next set of studies. That's what we haven't done well previously in pediatric brain tumors. So that's the, the whole idea. And then just to tell you, this has been a gargantuan effort. So this is the group that has been helping us get this done. It's literally a who's who of uh, everybody in pediatric neuro-oncology across the world. So we're really excited to open this. And the arms, again, are uh, based on what are prevalent alterations, what agents are available, which companies are willing to help us with this. And then as much as possible, recognizing that high-grade gliomas are really wily tumors. They'll figure out a way to um, bypass whatever aberration we try and inhibit, to try, if we can, to use combinations as much as possible. Then the other thing that's um, actually really, oh, sorry. 
really important is we're not just talking about, oh, you know what, if they have some kind of a PI3 kinase or MAP kinase pathway, they can enroll on this. We've actually defined it very, very clearly. What are they allowed to have to be able to enroll? Because what we also don't want to happen is five years down the line, we're like, okay, this arm failed. But if you look at it, we were too inclusive in the patients we allowed. So the arm failed because we didn't treat the right patients with the right drug. So we're trying to be very, very conscious of that, recognizing that at the end, patients will have at least one arm they can get on, and we need to put them on the best arm based on the aberrations they have. So we literally spent months talking with the genomics and pathology experts within the neuron community to say, give, define exactly who should go into what, which arm, right? So that's, that's um, actually been a really important part of this. So I'm gonna talk about one arm, and I'm gonna talk about this arm because it's gonna open in December. And this is target A, which is um, a phase two study of ribocyclib and everolimus. This is actually led by Margot Lazo, who's um, one of my colleagues at Nationwide Children's. And this is for patients who have um, alterations in the cell cycle and PI3 kinase mTOR pathway with newly diagnosed high-grade gliomas or DIPG. And the idea is you give them radiation and you follow it with the combination of um, these agents. We talked about this. This is the same uh, genomic landscape that we talked about. And again, if you look at um, this, you can see a lot of patients with high-grade gliomas and DIPG do have these pathways affected. So um, this is pretty prominent uh, for our group of patients. And again, we know that ribocyclib is uh, a cell cycle inhibitor. It's a CDK4-6 inhibitor. It's been FDA approved in advanced breast cancer. And actually, there's a combination that's approved with ribocyclib and everolimus in breast cancer. And everolimus is also um, approved. And this was actually the first drug in pediatric neuro-oncology to be approved in 2010 for treatment of SEGAs for um, patients with tuberous sclerosis. So we've had a long um, sort of sense of history of how this drug works and its toxicities, and we know the, um, the correct dose to give. So basically, the rationale for the combination is that there is preclinical evidence for synergy. There's data in pediatric brain tumor models with high-grade gliomas that it gets across blood-brain barrier. It does cause responses. It's been studied in breast cancer, and it's already been also studied in pediatric <laughs> recurrent CNS tumors. And we know what the right dose of not just each drug alone is, but the drugs in combination. So based on all these data, um, we did an initial study in newly diagnosed um, patients as a phase one study to say, okay, we know this is the combination dose, but in newly diagnosed patients with high-grade gliomas and DIPGs, what are the correct doses to give? Because what one of the problems for us is we know the blood-brain bar barrier penetration is an issue. So the higher you can get these doses, the more likely it is that you're going to get sustained responses. So without belaboring the point too much, we did a phase one study. 19 patients were enrolled. We looked at different levels, dose levels of drugs, and we found that basically very few of them had what we call dose-limiting toxicities. There was only one uh, grade three lung infection. Um, that we had at dose level three. So basically, we expanded that dose level, we enrolled more patients, and we recognized that really, you could go as high as this level without patients having too many toxicities. So this was called the dose level that we wanted to take into the phase two trial. Um, and when we looked at the initial patients with DIPG, and we have to put this in context. So diffuse intrinsic ponting glioma is a diffuse high-grade glioma of the pons. It's probably the worst disease we have in pediatric neuro-oncology. Median age for these patients is five to seven years of age. Overall prognosis is that most of these patients die. The median overall survival is eight to 11 months. At one year, only 38% of these patients are alive. At two years, it drops to about four to 10%, depending on which studies you look at, right? So again, very small numbers, so we don't want to inflate these data, very small numbers, but again, median over, o, overall survival was 13.9 months in 15 patients with DIPG. At one year, overall survival was 54% compared to the historical control of about 38 to 42. Two-year overall survival was 33% compared to 4 and 10, but again, remember, it's 15 patients, so you have one patient surviving it, you know, the, the denominator is small, so keep that under consideration. The bottom line is based on these results is why we're going to now be opening the phase two study.
And we also found not every patient on this phase one study was required to have a biopsy, right? So again, remember diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, it's in the brainstem. Most, a lot of neurosurgeons will feel very uncomfortable biopsying these patients. So um, more often than not, they're not biopsy. But in the patients where we did have um, biopsies done um, and or autopsies, because a lot of these patients agree as part of um, the altruistic approach the parents have, to um, to actually do autopsies so they can we can inform future studies and that's part of their child's legacy and it's really generous and amazing that um, patients have done that and honestly the reason we've moved forward in DIPG specifically is because of the generosity of families who've been willing to do that um, and so in this particular study we did note that if you had cell cycle abnormalities at least it seems like these are small numbers but those patients that had amplification or deletion did tend to um, live longer and respond better to this therapy again small numbers this is why we're doing the phase two you know it didn't seem to matter much in the two patients they were only 10 and 11 month survivors so the m4 pathway seemed to mean less in these two patients but again not to make too much of it but this is why we're now going to the phase two study so in this phase two study we're going to take patients with newly diagnosed high-grade gliomas including patients with diffuse intrinsic pontine gliomas give them radiation you've got to start therapy within 31 days and then you assign them an arm based on the molecular characterization so if they have the appropriate um, aberrations that we talked about for this study, they would then go on to get maintenance ribocyclob and everolimus. And these are daily oral drugs, right? So these kids can go to school, can do what they want. They're pretty well tolerated. I've had kids on this therapy like for three, four years, right? So pretty well tolerated and you can continue on therapy for up to two years. Primary endpoint for this is gonna be efficacy. What's the progression-free survival compared to the historical data we've talked about? We want to understand what the response rates are and also really important because we've not done this a lot in patients with high grade gliomas because they um, they tend to have such a poor prognosis. We haven't looked at patient reported outcomes. What's their quality of life like if God forbid they're going to die within a year? What are we doing to these kids? How bad and or how good is that quality of life over that period of time? And then, of course, we have a whole bunch of biological endpoints looking at um, multimodal biomarkers that might be predictive of response. So who's going to respond? Who's going to progress? Um, how are we going to look at immune profiling, genomics, imaging, radiogenomics? All of these things are going to be really critical aspects of this study. I won't go through this, but again, key eligibility is you have to have very specific cell cycle PI3 kinase mTOR pathway aberrations. And as I said, what's great about this study is you can be one year to 39 years of age. So, and why we included adolescent young adults, we realized that a lot of these patients end up having the H3K27 mutated midline tumors. And unfortunately, our adult colleagues don't have studies for those patients. They keep referring them to us. And then our studies used to stop at 21. So they sort of fell in the middle of this gap where nobody had studies for them. So that's why we've now included them in the entire target study, including this on. So this is just received FDA um, approval. We've got IRB approval, everything's done. So God willing, we're gonna be opening the first arm of the target study um, by December of this year. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to talk about, because I think this sort of brings it all home, was this whole discussion that we had about NTRAC, ALK, ROS, the young children with, um, high-grade gliomas that have these fusions that literally occur in about 47% of children with high-grade gliomas less than four years of age. So if you have a, if you see a newly diagnosed child with a high-grade glioma, it's really imperative that we do, we assess these fusions and do methylation because remember, it's even now a new diagnostic criteria within the WHO classification for the first time ever, right? So <clears throat> to, to try and treat these children appropriately upfront in Connect, we actually have Connect 1903, which is open, and Connect 2111, which is about to open. And these are clinical trials specifically for newly diagnosed. So all the studies we showed you were for recurrent patients who had responses when they took um, larotrectinib or other agents like this. But this is for newly diagnosed patients with high-grade gliomas that have these fusions, either NTRAC fusion or ROS-ALK. 
And if they have an MTRAC fusion, they'll enroll on 1903, which is the larotrectinib study. And the idea is you'll give them two months of larotrectinib upfront. If they respond well, that's fantastic. They can continue on single agent. If they, if they remain stable, we actually know that chemotherapy, unlike in adult high-grade gliomas, actually works pretty well in children, in young children with high-grade gliomas. So we don't want to deny them what would be considered standard of care. So unless they have an amazing response with the two cycles, and we've had patients who have continued on single agent, we would then combine the larotrectinib with standard care chemotherapy, both of them together, to see if we can actually um, improve overall survival for these patients. So the same thing for the uh, lorlatinib study, which is not yet open, but we're looking at feasibility of giving this in combination with chemotherapy. What are the response rate? And ultimately, and most importantly, what's the event-free survival? So just to, again, recap everything we've talked about. We've talked about how um, molecular characterization has affected diagnosis, stratification, treatment, prognosis, how the new paradigms we have are actually taking this into consideration. But what's critical to all this is we've got to be able to offer this to, our, to kids around this country, right? Um, one of the things that had been really disappointing for me as I've worked with my colleagues internationally is in a lot of other countries, molecular characterization is provided free of charge by the government as part of healthcare. And, you know, this is what you need to do for kids with um, tumors. We didn't have this in the U.S. Everybody would be sending to Foundation One, to NIH, to this place, to that place. Tissue would be going everywhere. We'd get these consults. There was no tissue left over. We didn't have the results. It was already six weeks in. We couldn't figure out what to do, so they would stand, start standard of care. What I'm really proud of is that the National Cancer Institute, in collaboration with the Children's Oncology Group and the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative, has put together this amazing program called um, the Molecular Characterization Project. And the idea for this is any child now with a brain tumor, but you know this rolled out in COG in March of 2021, but now sarcomas and rare tumors are part of this. It rolled out in the brain tumor program. Um, we'll, we'll enroll on the COG registry study, which is called APEC, Project Every Child. And those specimens will then undergo um, whole exome sequencing, RNA fusion panel, DNA methylation, and critical to this is that you'll get return of results within 21 days of all the tissue and blood being submitted to the biopathology center. This whole initiative is being actually run through Nationwide Children's Hospital in collaboration with COG through the biopathology center led by Nilsa Ramirez and the Institute for Genomic Medicine led by Elaine Marvis. So this has been amazing because we're getting all these return of results now within 21 days. Um, and I'll show you some of the current numbers. And what's also great is that the data, as part of the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative, is then deposited at the NCI, and it's already, we're already mining these data. They're already available to investigators around the world to be able to go in there and try and improve um, and inform how we do studies and how we treat patients. So this has been incredible. And um, as I said, this opened in through the CNS committee um, on March 21st, 2022, and this is the enrollment, cumulative enrollment. We've had almost 1,700, it's actually above 1,700 now because this is August numbers, 1,700 patients with just CNS tumors enrolled um, since its inception a year and a half ago. We're now getting a, an average of 115 uh, patients with brain tumors uh, submitting tissue per month across the country. And, you know, Honestly, a lot of us were very skeptical about the turnaround times. We're like, there's no way they're going to be able to do this within 21 days. But these are the median turnaround times. BPC, so the Biopathology Center to process it and give the Institute for Genomic Medicine the DNA and RNA to move forward with testing is four days from the time they receive uh, full tissue and blood samples from whatever site it's coming at. And the Institute for Genomic Medicine median time is 15 days to turn around the reports. So very few, and remember, most COG studies give you about 28 to 31 days to enroll a patient. So God willing, reasonable time to be able to actually do that. So this has been a game changer for all of us because when we keep talking about how are we gonna change the paradigm of treatment, it was dependent on whether we could actually do this in real time to help um, inform therapy for our patients. 
And the first study in the CNS committee, since this rolled out in the CNS committee, um, was actually the average risk medulloblastoma study that is currently, that just opened about a year ago, led by Ralph Saloom, who's one of my colleagues at Nationwide Children's Hospital. And again, remember, before we said all of these medulla studies were clinical diagnosis and pathology. You look at it under the microscope. Now we've included this whole idea that, you know, how do you actually define what is an average risk or a low risk medulla? This is based on data from methylation, from whole exome sequencing. We don't really need the fusion panel for this, but basically you have to get results for that to see if patients are eligible for 2031. And then if they're eligible, oops, sorry. If they're eligible, they go to chemo radiation. So they'll get, um, if they're low risk, which are the group four chromosome 11 loss patients, they actually get 18 gray CSI. If they're average risk, they get 23.4 and some and the posterior fossa boost. And then maintenance chemotherapy is very much similar to ACNS, was exactly the same as ACNS0331. But what we're adding is sodium thiosulfate to protect hearing. Why? Because 30 to 50% of kids with medulloblastoma historically get grade three hearing loss and require hearing aids, right? Again, remember, these are five-year-old kids who are trying to socialize, learn language, learn how to read. It makes a huge difference if you can protect their, their um, hearing. So um, this is the study that just opened up. Now, this requires that you submit tissue for the molecular characterization initiative. You can't get on it any other way. And then the other a study that we hope will open through the COG, again, looking at molecular pathways, is um, atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors. These are another kind of embryonal tumor in young children less than three or four years of age, although older patients can get it as well. Um, we've really understood so much more about this disease in the past five years. So just to put it in perspective, this disease was identified when I was a fellow in 1998, right? So we'd never heard of this till 1998. And in 2018, 20, whenever this was published, we've now figured out subgroups of atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor. We know that most of them have smart B1 loss, and this leads to EZH2 overexpression, and we actually have EZH2 inhibitors. So the idea then <clears throat> is based on initial data from the phase one study where we had good responses with tazemetostat in patients with recurrent um, ATRTs. We've now moved this into, sorry, move this into a newly diagnosed study based on the ACNS-033 um, data that were published. So again, to put it in perspective, this was two cycles of induction chemotherapy, platinum-based, three cycles of high-dose chemotherapy. The outcomes were the best that has ever been published, you know, 47, I mean, it's terrible, but it's better than what we've had before, 37 year, 37% four-year event-free survival compared to historical data. So, um, then, um, so in this study, what we're doing is doing exactly the same, but we're going to be adding tazemetostat at basically every part of this study during induction, during consolidation, not during radiation, but then giving six cycles of maintenance. Why did we do that? Because based on the subgroups of these patients, we know there's a subgroup of ATRTs who are extremely ag aggressive. Those are usually the mixed subgroup, and they end up progressing really quickly, even during induction. So that's what we're trying to do. And these are the objectives. So I guess in summary, what I wanted to show you during this talk was the impact of molecular characterization on patients and how by being able to define them pathologically, but also molecularly, we can actually change how we treat these patients and improve their outcomes. And I think the last thing I'll say, why it's really important to support endeavors like the Children's Oncology Group, PBTC, Connect, is that as we get to ever and ever smaller subgroups of patients, we have even smaller numbers. So for us to be able to actually change the field, we're going to have to collaborate internationally and break down all those regulatory and other barriers that, that often impede us from being able to do that. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody on this. Uh, <laughs> I won't name everybody, but especially our group at, at um, Nationwide Children's, the clinical team, the Connect team, the COG team, uh, all our funders, and most importantly, our patients and their families, without whom we couldn't do it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I ran over a little bit. It's, it's exactly one o'clock, but any questions? Any questions? Raise a hand. 
the molecular um, character characterization initiative. Um, I know that they uh, are looking at expanding it out of neural onc. Um, how are we going to be able to expand the capability to keep those wonderful times? Yeah. No, that, so the question was, how are we going to continue to expand the molecular characterization initiative beyond what is currently done? So um, this is like a five-year government initiative with a ton of money behind it. But again, right now, it's just CNS tumors, sarcomas, and rare tumors. And we've literally had these discussions of where do we go next? Um, a lot of people are saying we want this for recurrent patients because we don't have this. Um, I think funding is going to be the issue. So the next group, um, I believe, are going to be the neuroblastoma, high-risk neuroblastoma patients, and then I think osteosarcoma. Um, but th there, there are discussions about when, when can we actually do this for recurrent patients, because a lot of those patients have no other way of getting this. It's going to be a funding issue, I think. Any other questions? I don't have any online, so I think we're good. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.